The treatment of women under the Equal Protection Clause changed significantly during the 1970s. Before that time, laws that discriminated on the basis of sex were routinely upheld, but by the late 1970s, most sex-based laws would be unconstitutional. This video traces the high points of that major change in American law. Point v. Florida is an example of how sex discrimination used to be handled under the Equal Protection Clause. Under Florida law, as it then existed, both men and women could serve on juries, but there was a difference. Men were automatically eligible for jury duty, but women would only become eligible if they volunteered. The result was that only 1% of the people on the jury-eligible list were women. This law was challenged by Gwendolyn Hoyt. She was charged with second-degree murder for killing her physically abusive husband. So having women on her jury could well have changed the tenor of jury deliberations. But all 60 of the potential jurors in Hoyt's jury pool were male. So of course the trial jury that found her guilty was all male as well. In its decision, the U.S. Supreme Court acknowledged that the law treated men differently than women. But this was a classification that was judged only for rational basis. So what was the rational basis for not summoning women for jury duty? The court's reasoning was, more or less, that a woman's place is in the home. She should not be forced out of the domestic sphere to perform the jury duty expected of her male counterparts. Hoyt has since been overruled. And that change in law was a reflection of a broader change in society's views about what women were capable of doing and about the harms that are caused by sex discrimination. The feminist movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s was instrumental to that change in attitudes. One of the most influential lawyers to bring a feminist perspective into American law was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She actively litigated sex equality cases in the Supreme Court while she was also working as a law professor, and indeed she was the first woman to earn tenure at any Ivy League law school. In her 1970s litigation, Justice Ginsburg and her colleagues had two main goals, to categorize sex as a suspect classification and to highlight how sex-based laws relied on socially created stereotypes and not genuine biological differences. The first victory for this movement came with Reed v. Reed. In Idaho, a statute determined who would be the administrator of a deceased person's estate. As a tiebreaker, the statute preferred males over females. This law was challenged by Sally Reed, who was prevented from acting as the administrator for her late son's estate. The state's justification was that it was rational to have some sort of easily administered tiebreaker and sex was easy to administer, and it's as good as any other tiebreaker, like being a whole relative rather than a half relative. However, the Supreme Court unanimously held that this was not a good enough justification for a sex-based law. And with that decision, Reed v. Reed became the first U.S. Supreme Court case to hold that a law was unconstitutional because it discriminated on the basis of sex. Ever since it was decided, there have been debates about whether the Reed opinion was really a rational basis decision or whether the court was perhaps using something stricter than that without quite saying so. Those arguments are beyond the scope of this video. The level of scrutiny for sex-based laws was front and center in Frontier v. Richardson. In that case, a federal law would automatically give male service members health insurance for their wives but female service members would not always receive it for their husbands. This law was challenged by Lieutenant Sharon Frontiero of the U.S. Air Force. Because she was female, her family had to pay extra for her spouse's health insurance, an expense that they would not have incurred if Lieutenant Frontiero had been a man married to a woman. An eight-to-one majority of the court found the law unconstitutional, but there was no majority on the reasoning. A plurality opinion said that sex-based classifications should receive strict scrutiny. For these four justices, sex, like race and national origin, is an immutable characteristic determined solely by accident of birth. Because the country had 
a long and unfortunate history of sex discrimination, sex-based laws were inherently suspect. Three concurring justices also ruled in favor of Frontiero, but they refused to adopt strict scrutiny for sex discrimination cases. One concurring justice issued a one-sentence statement that the law was unconstitutional under Reed, without attempting to say what level of scrutiny the Reed case demanded. And finally, one justice dissented. So the result of Frontiero is that another law was declared to be unconstitutional sex discrimination, but there was not yet majority agreement about the reasoning. A higher level of scrutiny might be possible, but it hadn't been agreed on. The uncertainty was finally resolved in Craig v. Boren. An Oklahoma law set different drinking ages for low-alcohol beer, known as 3.2 beer or near beer. Women could buy it at age 18 but men could not buy it until age 21. This law was challenged by two plaintiffs, Curtis Craig, a male who could not buy near beer at age 18, and Carolyn Whitener, the owner of a liquor store who could not sell near beer to customers like Craig. In the Supreme Court, the vote count was again 8 to 1 against the law, but this time there was a majority on the reasoning. It contained a standard that we now know as intermediate scrutiny. The Craig v. Boren test for intermediate scrutiny uses the words you see here. For a sex-based law to be constitutional, it must serve an important governmental interest, not merely legitimate, but not necessarily compelling. And the law's reliance on a sex classification must be substantially related to that important interest, not merely reasonably related, but not necessarily narrowly tailored. What this means for today's black letter law is that a third level of scrutiny exists in addition to the ones that were envisioned back in the 1930s and 1940s. It's used for laws that classify on the basis of sex and laws that classify on the basis of the person being born to parents who are not married to each other. These are sometimes but not always called quasi-suspect classifications to distinguish them from the suspect classifications of race and national origin. So far, intermediate scrutiny has not been used under the fundamental rights prong of equal protection. Now, you may see some legal writing that uses the term heightened scrutiny. This is meant to refer to any kind of scrutiny that is stricter than rational basis review. The term heightened scrutiny can be useful because, on the whole, intermediate scrutiny tends to have more in common with strict scrutiny than it has with rational basis review. Only a small subset of cases seem to involve laws that might survive intermediate scrutiny but flunk strict scrutiny. Uh, the much bigger difference is between rational basis review and anything more strict than that.